Hello everyone and welcome to the Speculative Wildlife Research Center where we reimagine creatures and monsters from all realms of fiction through the lens of speculative biology. Today we will be having a very special episode based not only on suggestions but on complete ideas you guys left in the comments below. As you know, lots of episodes from the channel have come from your own ideas and suggestions. There are times, however, when the suggestion provided for some reason or another, does not make it into an episode. This happens, for example, when the suggestion would make for a drawing or script too similar to an already existing or upcoming episode. Or the idea behind the suggestion is already so good and complete that I feel like using it in a special way, showcasing the commenter's work. That's why, today, we will be taking a look at your own ideas and seeing what these creatures would be like as real living animals. While mostly based on the ideas provided, I will give my own speculative biology notes whenever it is relevant. If you guys like this video, I may eventually turn this into a whole series, featuring ideas that wouldn't make it into a regular episode for the reasons stated above. Also, if you are enjoying this channel's videos, please consider supporting the channel on Ko-fi, link available in the video's description. Now, without further ado, let's get started. Our first creature of the day is the Lucifer, Speopithecus infernalis, which are apes descended from prehistoric human ancestors that diverged from genus Australopithecus, adapting to an incredibly different habitat. These hominid apes evolved to live in caves and the underground, which they rarely leave. Given the horrible vision of one or more of these creatures peeking out of their caves during the night, People who ever saw one mistakenly believed these caves to be entrances to hell itself and would avoid them like the plague, even earning these creatures their name. One can hardly blame them, as the appearance of these creatures is nothing short of hellish. Due to their mostly subterranean habitat, Lucifer lack almost all pigment on their skin and hair, making them look pale and sickly. Since they live in hotter climates, Lucifer have very short and sparse fur, which covers very little of their bodies. While not reaching the levels of intelligence of humans, Lucifer are incredibly smart creatures, at times enjoying themselves in deliberately scaring others or being mischievous. These creatures are omnivorous by nature, but will feed on meat most of the time, since vegetable food can be hard to come by in their habitat. They are very smart generalist hunters, and will easily hunt prey as diverse as cave-dwelling invertebrates, fish, lizards and even bats, which they will catch in their sleep. Their white coloration makes them stand out from the darkness of the caves, but that is hardly a problem when most of their prey is blind anyway. Every once in a while, however, the lucifer will leave their caves to search for fruit, roots and plant shoots which they can easily rip using their sharp nails. The eyes of these creatures are huge, since they need to see well in both the night outside their caves and the darkness inside them. Whenever they can find a rare fruit, they will enjoy it immensely and seem to prefer apples above all. The mouth of these apes is filled with sharp teeth, which are equally useful for ripping flesh or tearing into fruit and roots. Our first creature of the day is Lucifer Morningstar, suggested by Dylan Hutton. This creature comes to us from the animated series Has Been Hotel. Granted, Lucifer Morningstar is more of a person than a creature in its original setting, which made it a little hard for me to work on it, but Dylan's great suggestion gave me good stuff to work with. While I tried to keep most of what Dylan suggested in the comments, I did adjust some of it to make it more plausible, but it was just the smallest part of it. Thanks a lot for the idea, Dylan. If you guys are interested, you can find Dylan in DeviantArt as Dylan613. Now on to our next creature.
Today, we will see a creature that, along with many others, has given rise to the belief that, sometimes, the dead come back to life to feast on the living. The zombie wasp, Anthrospex tomaclamis, is a close relative of the skeleton wasp, a creature we have seen in the show before. It is very similar in size to the skeleton wasp, but its exoskeleton is reddish, which helps it camouflage in a very different manner. Rather than compensating for their frailty with sheer stealth, the zombie wasps will hunt by disguising themselves as carcasses. Due to their general shape and size, these disguise will work best when using the corpses of human beings, but any corpse will serve their purpose. These wasps have developed stronger claws, which help them tear into the carcasses and sleep inside them. They will shamble slowly inside their rotten armor, stopping only when they have detected the presence of potential prey. Once they have, they will lay down in wait, until their prey is attracted by their smell. This works because a lot of creatures in nature will scavenge from fresh corpses, but also means the effectiveness of this lure will go down the longer the corpse rots. For this reason, zombie wasps tend to use the recently ripped skin of their latest kill. While this camouflage did not evolve to attract human beings, it resulted great for that purpose. After all, the smell of a rotten corpse can indicate a lot of things, and humans are likely to investigate for the sake of their own safety. Once the wasp spray is close enough, it will rise quickly and use its venomous stinger to kill its prey. Their disguise will protect them well enough against any attempts to hurt it, and the venom acts fast enough to ensure any resistance ends in a matter of seconds. The zombie wasp will then be free to feed at their leisure, eating everything but the outer skin of their victim, sating their hunger for a while. Whenever they feel hungry again, however, the recognizable shell of their last victim will shamble to life once again. This creature was suggested by Jennifer, who gave a pretty cool idea for a zombie based on the skeleton wasp from our last Halloween episode. Zombies, at least in their more modern form, hailing from horror movies, are either undead or living but infected people that ravenously feed on the flesh of the living, and it made sense to make them related to the skeleton wasp as similarly predatory, superficially human-shaped creatures. Based on this idea, I created the zombie wasp, partially taking inspiration from Acanthaspis petax, a species of assassin bug that preys on ants and uses the bodies of dead ants as camouflage. Thanks a lot for the idea, Jenny. You can find Jenny in DeviantArt as Jenny Wolfgall. Now, let's see our final creature of the day. The last research subject we will see today is a vicious predator that defies expectations of all that lay eyes on it. The Kirby's. When Kirby's are barely tadpoles, they will already be great hunters, although they will act as omnivores, devouring both animals small enough to fit in their mouths, which give them the necessary nutrients to grow and develop, and plant material, which will be digested in order to produce methane. This methane will be stored in small deposits inside the Kirby's body, useful only once it has grown up. The methane will be kept inside a system of sacs located along the Kirby's body, very slightly compressed against it. These sacs are developed from the vocal sac of other species of frog, and can likewise be expanded to an amazing degree. Once expanded, these methane sacs will give the Kirby a wider area, allowing it to jump more and even float in the air for limited amounts of time. Once in the air, the Kirby will move along with its paddle feet, allowing it limited but fast movements it will use to catch its airborne prey. On land, while an awkward looking creature, these same methane sacs will make it deceptively light and mobile, 
helping it hunt any prey it can fit in its mouth. Despite being only 20 cm or 8 inches tall, the seemingly harmless Kirby will often be top predators of their environment. Any creatures too big for the Kirby to eat will be driven away by the Kirby inflating suddenly, looking bigger and squeaking loudly to intimidate the potential predator. This idea was suggested by Marx the Enigma as a speculative biology version of Kirby from the Kirby video games. Marx suggested an amphibian based Kirby and I used that general idea for this version, along with some of their suggestions to give shape to our speculative Kirby. While Marx's idea, like some of their other amazing concepts for Kirby creatures, are based on their own extraterrestrial world, but I adapted those ideas to a version more fitting to our own alternate planet Earth. Thanks a lot for the idea, Marx. You can find Marx in DeviantArt as Chicken Peep and in Tumblr as ChickenPip77. And that's it for a speculative biology look into three of the ideas you guys have placed in the comments. I had a lot of fun doing this episode, and I'm very happy to be honoring some of your ideas in a very special episode like this. Working on the videos for this channel has been a ton of fun, and I'm very thankful for all of you guys watching, giving great ideas and helping the channel grow. As always, if there's any type of creature you would like me to give the speculative biology treatment in the show, please sound off in the comments below. As I have mentioned, I do take into account all of your ideas, and some of them are bound to end up in special videos for the channel. Thank you, thank you, and thank you all for watching, and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.